Greetings. My name is Raju Rajakopal, and I'm a longtime activist living in the San Francisco Bay Area. I have spent considerable time in India over the past three decades working on rural development, disaster relief, and interfaith harmony initiatives. I'm currently working with Hindus for Human Rights, an advocacy organization that stands for human rights and religious freedom of all communities in the United States and in India. As the world's two largest democracies go through unprecedented challenges in these times, it is absolutely vital that those of us who care for democracy keep ourselves informed about where our two countries are headed. It is particularly important at this juncture that Americans, including our lawmakers, get a sense of how dire the ground situation is in India, especially for the minorities, compared to where we are. With that in mind, I present this video workshop on where India is headed under Prime Minister Modi's leadership. Thank you for watching. Many historians and commentators are warning that the current political rule in India is heading towards fascism. This may come as a surprise to those who see India as a trusted geostrategic and business partner with a commitment to fundamental rights and religious pluralism. Are the threats to Indian democracy being overstated? One way to answer that question is to critically examine the Modi regime through the prism of European fascism. So I call this presentation Hindu nationalists and the dreaded F word. The world must recognize and acknowledge signs of fascism before it is too late. Let's begin with a long list of troubling developments under the current Indian government. Introducing religion as a qualifier for granting citizenship, move to forcefully alter the demographics of Muslim majority Kashmir, mob lynchings and mounting violence against minorities, anti-conversion laws and assault on indigenous Adivasi communities, attacks on those defending and celebrating diversity, targeting artists, activists, journalists, and academics, intimidation and blackmail of the media into towing the party line, violating parliamentary rules to ram through anti-people legislations, co-opting the judiciary and other statutory bodies, use of archaic sedition and anti-terror laws, quote unquote, to stifle dissent, unleashing the ruling party social media to attack opponents, and the worsening attacks on Dalit communities. Are these merely a series of unconnected events or the inevitable outcomes of a certain ideology? To answer that question, we must go back nearly a century to the founding of the Hindu Mahasabha and the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, the RSS. As this 2018 article reminds us, far from being indigenous to India, Modi's RSS adopted its chauvinistic ideas and its methods from European fascism. B.S. Munje of the Hindu Mahasabha was a mentor and hero of Dr. Hedgewar, the founder of the RSS. He visited fascist military academies in 1931 and met with Mussolini. He congratulated Mussolini on the fascist youth and military organizations that he had constituted, adding that India needed similar organizations. He proceeded to note that the RSS is one such organization.
Now let's look at Hindu nationalism as defined by its own early leaders. Savarkar in 1923 coined the term Hindutva and went on to found the Hindu Mahasabha. Here is, a, here is what he said. The essence of the life of a nation is the life of that portion of its citizens whose interests and history and aspirations are most closely bound up with the land. O oh, Hindus, consolidate and strengthen Hindu nationality. Render it impossible for others to betray her. Savarkar sowed the first seed of an exclusive Hindu Rashtra, that is, a Hindu nation. And he defined the undesirable other by associating them with the term betrayal. He went on, take the case of America, Negro citizens there sympathize more with brethren in Africa than with their white countrymen. American state in the last resort must stand or fall with the fortunes of its Anglo-Saxon constituents. So with the Hindus. So he drew an unmistakable parallel between Hindu nationalism and white nationalism, an idea that today's Hindu nationalists, especially in the United States, or trying to run away from. Savarkar went on in 1944 in an interview with an American reporter who asked him, how do you plan to treat the Mohammedans, that is the Muslims in India, as a minority in the position of your Negroes? And if the Mohammedans succeed in seceding and set up their own country, as in your country, there will be civil war. So he defined Hindu Rashtra as one that would treat Muslims as second class citizens, just as America was treating its black citizens. Hedgewar, the founder of the RSS, had this thing to say. One may outwardly carry out certain acts which appear to involve physical violence, but if it is done in a spirit of detachment and without any selfish motive or hatred, the act, the act can no longer be termed violent. An astounding statement from the founder of the RSS justifying violence, which his followers today seem to have taken to the streets of India in a big way. This is Hedge War's legacy in 2020 in many parts of India. Hindu nationalists who raised their sticks and swords to maim and kill are roaming free, while those who are bloodied and on the ground are accused of imaginary crimes and are jailed. Goldwalker, the second RSS chief, had this to say about Germany. To keep up the purity of the nation and its culture, Germany shocked the world by her purging the country of Semitic races, the Jews. National pride at its highest has been manifested here. Germany has also shown how well it is impossible for races and cultures having differences going to the root to be assimilated into one united whole, a good lesson for us in Hindustan to learn and profit by. Golwalkar openly admired Hitler and saw the Nazis as a role model for India. When Hindu nationalists today speak of Hindu pride, watch out. We must understand that it comes shrink wrapped with hatred for Muslims and Christians. What messages did the founders of RSS leave for today's young recruits who see them as role models? You will find them in the children's book series sold at RSS bookstores. Here is Hedge War. Somebody threw stones at us. We, in turn, beat somebody. One of the speakers spoke slightingly of Tilak. He went straight to the stage and slapped the speaker on the cheek. Bands sometimes sure to play before the masjid. Dr. G himself would take over the drums 
and rouse the dormant manliness of the Hindus. His message is to the young. Hindus lack manliness. Incitement and violence are okay in pursuit of a larger goal. Here's what Goldfalker says to the young recruits. He raised his hand, clenched his fist, and brought down a hammer-like blow. The glass pane was reduced to splinters. Those cherishing extra-national loyalties can only be called traitors. Will it not be treacherous if an individual is drawing inspiration from elements beyond the boundaries of his country? By this statement, most of the Indians living abroad today with loyalties to both India and their adopted country would be considered traitors, wouldn't they? His message is to the young. Hindus must publicly show off their strength, Shaurya. Muslims and Christians will always be traitors. Such is the legacy of the RSS going back several decades, which informs today's ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, BJP. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and most of his ministers in the BJP were schooled in camps of the RSS and grew up with Hedgevar and Goldwalker as their role models. Let us now take a look at the Modi regime through the prism of European fascism. Early warning signs of fascism, as listed by Lawrence Britt, businessman and writer, and as seen in the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. Number one, powerful and continuing nationalism. Today's RSS is trying to achieve Goldwalker's dream by force and by fiat, something that they were not able to accomplish in 1947. The man stoking nationalism in India could succeed Modi one day, says this headline, Amit Shah's pro-Hindu agenda threatens India's secular roots. Pro-Hindu? I think not. Progressive Hindus do not see anything pro-Hindu about a party that has hijacked a religion purely to stay in political power. More accurately stated, theirs is an anti-minority agenda, pure and simple. You see on the left, Hedgevar, the founder of the RSS, and on the right, you see Goldwalker the longest president of the RSS. The presence of so many young people in the Hindu Swayam Sevak Sangh March in Texas raises two important questions. One, what motivates them to march behind fascist RSS leaders like Hedgevar and Golwalkar after having learned in our schools and colleges about the dark days of slavery, fascism, and the Holocaust. Two, are they aware that they are in this country largely as a result of the civil rights struggle and America's welcome to immigrants and multiculturalism, people like themselves? The same rights that their RSS, HSS leaders and teachers would deny the minorities in India. Moving on to Hindu nationalist politics in our country, about which most Americans have little knowledge. The Modi-Trump gala in Houston in 2019 strengthened the intersection of Hindu nationalism and Trump nationalism or white nationalism in the US election. And it may have emboldened Hindu American lawmakers and candidates for office to seek the direct support and funding from Hindu nationalists associated with the RSS and HSS. Here's one such organization, Overseas Friends of BJP. They may have overreached 
following the Modi Trump gala and was forced to register as a foreign agent in recent weeks. Democratic candidate Sri Preston Kulkarni from Texas is reported to have been put up by Hindu nationalists in the US. He continues to evade the issue, but privately tells some donors that he's unable to distance himself from the RSS HSS. Democratic Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy from Illinois also reportedly supported and funded by Hindu nationalists. He openly gives thumbs up to HSS Chicago as they celebrate Hedgevar and Goldwalker. Sign number two, disdain for human rights. The government of India, led by the Prime Minister Narendra Modi, is desperately trying to crush human rights work in India. The raid and subsequent freezing of accounts of Amnesty India is the most recent and chilling evidence of it. Amnesty India is only one of many human rights organizations that have been silenced. In this case, even though Amnesty India is entirely India funded, BJP uses the bogey of Western influence to defend its forcible shutdown with its supporters. Sign number three, identification of enemies as a unifying cause. The prime minister's Hindu nationalist government has cast 200 million Muslims as internal enemies. The context? Citizenship Amendment Act, CAA, which has raised many serious legal, moral, and ethical questions. One such question, US lawmakers are being told that the CAA is meant to give asylum to persecuted minorities from neighboring countries. So what could be wrong with it? Well, if so, why are 1 million undocumented Hindus living in the state of Assam being offered citizenship under the same law, even though they're not asylum seekers. While one million Muslims in a similar situation are at risk of being sent to the notorious detention camps. Is it any surprise that over 200 million Muslims of India fear that their citizenship too can be taken away at the slightest pretext under the new laws supported by Modi and Shah? Defining the enemy through caricatures and cartoons. Anti-Semitic caricatures were an integral part of Nazi propaganda designed to demonize the Jews. In India, Islamophobic and xenophobic cartoons and trolls defining the other, the enemy, dominate the BJP RSS social media. Today, sadly, even the liberal print media is not immune. On the left is an anti-Semitic cartoon portraying unpatriotic Jews, quote unquote, stabbing the Third Reich in the back. On the right is a cartoon in a liberal Indian newspaper portraying COVID-19 dressed up as a Muslim holding the world hostage. A method to the madness. The BJP and RSS orchestrate and control their daily attacks on perceived enemies through their IT cell, which then are spread worldwide by an army of Hindu nationals, sometimes within the hour. The prime minister is an ardent follower of some of the more notorious trollers, we are told. BJP's IT cell finds enemies, attacks and targets them every day, says the book. This book called I'm a Troll was published some time ago but since then, the level of trolling and direct attacks have increased many fold since Modi government came back to power in 2019 and since the COVID lockdowns. Supremacy of the military, not unique to India, of course. Modi reimagines the Indian military. 
India was the second largest arms importer in 2015 to 19. Russia share of Indian arms market declined. India signs two billion dollar weapons deal with Israel. So the mega agreement is considered to be the largest defense contract in Israel's defense industries. So there are major attempts underway at remaking a stronger but more politically servile Indian army. While not unique to India, this focus amid all the other signs of authoritarianism on the one hand and the mounting woes of ordinary workers on the other should worry all of us, whether in India or overseas. Rampant sexism, again, not unique to the BJP. However, as they're in charge today, what they say and do directly affects the safety of women in India. And look at what they're saying. Stay indoors, stop wearing jeans and skirts. Don't use cell phones, don't go out at night. If you're out late, you ask for it. It's all your fault, woman. The wave of sexist outbursts from political leaders reflects the country's deeply entrenched bias against women. A few months back, the culture minister opined that girls wanting a night out may be all right elsewhere, but it's not part of Indian culture. The leader of the RSS today once said, you, woman, look after household chores and satisfy me. I, the man, will take care of you. His colleague in BJP, women should never overstep the Lakshman Rekha, that invisible boundary of decency. Of course, women are trying to push back. Here's one headline. RSS mindset of women being excluded is not Indian culture. Stuck with its medieval values, the sun, that is the RSS, turns a blind eye to the fact that societies are not impervious to change. But the travesty goes on. While there is universal outrage over the gang rape of a Dalit woman in Hathras, Uttar Pradesh, a BJP leader says that the four men accused of the gang rape are innocent. And it's a victim who was Avara. Control of the mass media. Here's one headline from some time ago. Under Modi, India's press is not so free anymore. I think that's an understatement today. India's government has pressured advertisers and even shut down channels to shape the information that 1.3 billion Indians receive is part of a wider assault on dissent. Digital media, the fifth estate, which has been doing a heroic job of covering real news, is now being squeezed from all sides and their donors are being pressured to stop funding them. Many of the sources for this video incidentally come from the fifth estate. I doubt in a few months from now, we will have those sources still available to the world. India ranks 142nd on the Global Press Freedom Index. Depressing indeed. Has always been so in the last few years. It's only getting worse. But for Hindu nationalists, the good news is that we are better than Bangladesh and we are better than Pakistan. However, there have been constant press freedom violations, including police violence against journalists, ambushes by political activists, and reprisals instigated by criminal groups or corrupt local officials. On the other hand, pro-BJP journalists and media persons have all the freedom in the world to say whatever they want, including this incendiary tweet by the editorial director of Swarajya magazine, Mr. Jagannathan. Hindus should know they are in a long-term civilizational war Every Hindu must commit to do his bit and fight on till the goal is achieved. What does Mr. Jagannathan mean? What do you mean, Mr. Jagannathan, when you say that every Hindu must commit till the goal is achieved? Are you talking about eliminating 200 million Muslims and other minorities from India? 
Is that your way of ensuring global peace? Obsession with national security. This goes along with supremacy of the military. Here is one analyst talking about India's new security order. Perhaps one could call it the Modi Shah doctrine. He identified three characteristics of this new order. The emphasis on risk taking and assertiveness. Fusing of domestic and international politics and the inevitable unrelenting spin to hold critics at bay. So the article went on to say, the ball court strike inside Pakistan and the Kashmir decision have been deeply woven into electoral campaigning and domestic politics. This is double-edged, susceptible to demagoguery and unintended consequences. Demagoguery? I agree wholeheartedly. We have seen way too much of that in India. But unintended intended consequences? I doubt very much whether the architects of this plan didn't know what the consequences were. They fully knew what they were and were prepared for it, for the intended consequences, so to speak. India's external affairs minister Jai Shankar argues that India is pursuing a new phase of its foreign policy. India needs to settle its borders by creating a new status quo in Jammu and Kashmir. Sound like Israel? These assertive policies have been holding the lives of 7 million Kashmiris hostage for over a year with no end in sight. But these 7 million Kashmiris are Indian citizens and they are paying the price for the new doctrine. Their suffering hardly seems to bother the BJP RSS rulers who are obsessed with forcibly changing the demographics of the valley. Religion and government intertwined is number eight. The prime minister, supposedly of all the people of India, breaking the ground for a Hindu temple at a site in Ayodhya, where his colleagues destroyed an ancient mosque in 1992, for which nobody has been punished. His supporters gleefully celebrated this occasion as a triumph over Muslims. Not coincidentally, the date of this occasion was August 5, 2020, the first anniversary of the lockdown of Muslim majority Kashmir. Earlier in 2015, Mr. Modi had paid his tribute to the Hindu Mahasava leader Savarkar, saying he ignited the spark of nationalism in several lives. It would seem to be that that very spark ignited entire Muslim neighborhoods in Delhi earlier this year. Some of Mr. Modi's party colleagues, on the other hand, decided to unveil a statue of Mahatma Gandhi's assassin, not to Ram Godse, and to pay him rich tributes. Godse was also a disciple of Savarkar and of the RSS, just as Modi and Shah are. How does RSS respond to such criticism? Indian constitution was originally not supposed to be secular and it was only with the 42nd amendment in 1976 that the word secular was inserted, says one RSS Pracharak. I do not think there's anything like jingoism, nationalism or hyper-nationalism. These are Western concepts, sneers another RSS Pracharak. So what's clear is that the RSS is laying the groundwork to dismantle the secular Indian constitution that has stood by all of us for over 70 years. I do not think that an organization that adopted Italian fascism as a model has any moral light right at this point to point fingers at the West for its ills. 
Corporate power protected. Billionaire beneficiaries of BJP schemes, says this headline. Unlike the many oligarchs in Russia who control power, in India there are only a handful of billionaires who control a major part of the economy and, of course, the Modi government. Example, Mukesh Ambani of Reliance Industries, who is seen as more powerful than Mr. Modi. Thanks to his relationship, Reliance Geo came from far behind other mobile providers some time back to virtually rule the communication space today and also incidentally giving room for all the IT communication necessities of the Hindu nationalists today. The flip side, besides President Trump's interference in Indian politics at the Houston rally in 2019 with Mr. Modi, multinationals like Facebook are also now directly interfering in Indian politics on the side of Mr. Modi and the BJP. Facebook interfering with India's electoral democracy, Congress writes to Mark Zuckerberg. Facebook executives supported India's Modi, disparaged opposition in internal messages says this headline. The day before Narendra Modi was victorious in India's 2014 Indian elections, Anki Das of Facebook India posted, we lit a fire to his social media campaign. It's taken us nearly six years to go behind the scenes. And today I understand finally, Anki Das has resigned from Facebook, but get this one, they replaced her with another Hindu nationalist supporter of Modi. Labor laws suppressed. You may remember the heart-wrenching images of thousands of migrant laborers walking hundreds of miles towards their homes, sparked by the Modi government's mishandling of COVID-19 lockdown in its early days. Some in India had hoped that those images would generate the political will to provide better workplace protections and health care to India's massive migrant labor force. Alas, instead, the Modi government is moving fast to dismantle even the current regulations. The political fix. Why are Indian states junking labor laws in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis? BJP ruled states like Uttar Pradesh are exempting businesses from the purview of almost all the labor laws for the next three years. Inevitably, all of this designed to enrich the rich even further, while the poor and blue collar workers are going to suffer even more post COVID. Sign number 11, disdain for intellectuals and the arts. Major national institutions of arts, culture, and history have been taken over by RSS, BJP, ideologues, and acolytes. The result is widespread attacks on artists and intellectuals seen as Modi critics or as not sufficiently supportive of the BJP government. Here's one headline talking about the National Gallery of Modern Art where a famous playwright and author, Palekar, was stopped in the middle of his speech and hounded out, sparking this comment. This is supposed to be a democratic country, but under this present government, artists are stopped from speaking out. This artist has been pushing the envelope to make his art form Carnatic classical music and those of marginalized and minority communities accessible to one another. For that, he has been trolled as anti-Hindu, unpatriotic, Hindu-phobic, and far worse. And here is the latest. Hindu nationalists take aim at Bollywood. RSS antipathy towards the syncretic history of Bollywood is well known. Their specific attacks on Muslim artists has been particularly vicious over the years. 
And now that they have the levers of power, they may be out to destroy the industry as we know it and as the world has known it. Number 12, obsession with crimes and punishment. I added the word selective because by no means is the Modi regime serious about all crimes and seeking to punish the guilty. Instead, it seems to be focused on a few selective quote unquote crimes that serves their self-interest. Take the case of Bima Corregon. The case dates back to 2018 when violence had erupted near Bima Corregon in Pune district, when Dalit groups were celebrating 200 years of a war fought between Dalits and Marathas, where Dalits had emerged victorious. The Pune police had booked activists from Hindu nationalist groups, two of them, Ekbote and Bide, for allegedly inciting the violence. Well, the Supreme Court granted bail to Ekbote and the police never arrested Bide. However, later that year, the police arrested 10 activists in connection with the violence and accused them of having links with the banned Communist Party of India, Maoist. Most of those activists are still in prison. Today, there are 16 of them. The latest to be arrested under the case is a Jesuit priest and activist who is standing between the Adivasis in their ancestral forest lands and multinationals who are very keen on getting at the minerals beneath those lands with the assistance of Modi and Shah. Father Stan Swami arrested under false charges in India, says this headline. Here it is. Here is a statement he recorded before he was arrested. What is happening to me is not something unique to me, happening to me. It is a broader process that is taking place all over the country. We are all aware how prominent intellectuals, lawyers, writers, sports, activists, students, leaders, they're all put into jail because they have expressed their dissent or raised questions about the ruling powers of India. Yesterday, Secretary Pompeo was in India speaking to Prime Minister Modi, and we certainly hope that he would have brought out with him the issue of the Bhima Koragon 16, including Father Stan, and demand that they be released forthwith. Rampant cronyism and corruption. It's enough to say this. The rise of the monopolists in Modi's India, that headline tells it all. Ambani, Adani, and a handful of other billionaires have made crony capitalism an art form under the Modi regime. To the extent now people are not talking about BJP, they're talking about AAP, Ambani Adani party as being in charge of India with a sense of humor. Finally, number 14, fraudulent elections. The sign, final sign of fascism. India's National Election Commission, once considered to be the strongest pillar of Indian democracy, is now also in jeopardy. Elections have become meaningless in India. The BJP wins even when it loses. Who needs elections when the BJP is going to install its government everywhere by hook or by crook? BJP won, but Election Commission lost, says this headline. Rarely has the Election Commission of India been blamed for its partisan conduct, but 2019 has been an exception. Electoral bonds, a clever new scheme brought out by the Modi government, which will allow anybody from overseas and in India to contribute to party funds in India, as long as they have Indian passports, through electoral bonds, which are completely transparent. Uh, completely not transparent, what I meant. And uh, nobody can audit where the monies are coming from. By their design, electoral bonds legitimize opacity in how elections are funded. 
there is concern that electoral bonds could become vehicles for money laundering for shell companies or for prohibited foreign donations. So while the intent is Indian passport holders overseas, we have absolutely no idea if monies are coming from other sources as long as we cannot audit them. There you have it, the 14 signs of fascism seen in the Indian context. What do they all add up to? Powerful and continuing nationalism, disdain for human rights, identification of enemies, supremacy of the military, rampant sexism, controlling the media, obsession with national security, religion and government intertwined, corporate laws protected, labor laws suppressed, disdain for intellectuals, obsession with selective crimes, rampant cronyism, fraudulent elections. The Modi rule scores 14 out of 14 on science of fascism, which prompts me to say that these are not early warning signs of fascism. Indeed, they are imminent signs of fascism. There are two other sides of fascism that we did not talk about. One is the cult of Modi personality. If I may add here, that cult is being maintained very well, not through Indian sources, but through Park Avenue Western ad companies. 16, majority Hindu community in denial. When majority Hindus wake up and finally see through the Modi cult and acknowledge the F word, it may be too late to save Indian democracy is my fear. That is why it's important for the rest of the world to speak up now. BJP, RSS have been described variously in the past as Hindu Tvadis, Hindu fundamentalists, Hindu nationalists, Hindu supremacists. But after examining the Delhi Modi regime through the prism of European history, there is little doubt that it bears all the hallmarks of fascism. Fascism by any other name is still fascism. History tells us that if we do not push back strongly against emerging fascism, we may be paving the way for a genocide. So our ask, write to your congressman or senator expressing your deep concern about the inroads of Hindu nationalism into our body politic, which is already ailing from racism and white nationalism. Write to the Democratic Party bosses asking them why they're allowing the party to become a home for lawmakers who are connected with fascist Hindu organizations. Would they remain indifferent if white nationalists or the KKK were to openly fund a democratic candidate? Share this video with friends so they can educate themselves on the changing nature of the Indian American community in the last few years. For comments, Further information and media sources used in this video, please contact me at raju at hindusforhumanrights.org. For more about Hindus for Human Rights, please log on to www.hindusforhumanrights.org. Thank you and have a good day.